That's <laughs> the plan. All righty. I guess we'll get started. It's uh, 12 10. Excellent. So um, I have the chance. Um, I'm Carrie Morgan. I'm sure you guys know who I am. But, anyways, I'm really happy that we're creating this faculty forum where not all of our um, creatives here are always making objects. Um, they do other things as well. And this will be the second time that Joshua was given um, a noontime talk. And the last one was really interesting. And I'm really excited about this one, too. But just some background um, about Namdev excuse me, Joshua. Um, he's a designer, author, educator, and occasional artist. He's the principal of the MBA studio, where he and a small group of collaborati collaborators design books, t-shirts and posters for DVS Shoes, ES Skateboarding, Mark Batty Publisher, MCAD, and The Soap Factory, among others. The MBA's work has been published in the best-selling design books, Handjob, a catalog of type, and as well as Pulled, a catalog of screen printing, both of which were um, by Mike Perry for Princeton Architectural Press. Their design of the book DIY album art, paper bags, and office supplies was named one of 2009's best 50 best design books by AIGA. Um, Joshua is the author of three books about design and visual culture, including New Skateboard Graphics and Function, Restraint, and Subversion in Typography. Um, and he is the co-host of a podcast about design practice and education that's titled through process. So let us welcome Joshua. Thank you. Hi. That bio is really cringy only because it hasn't been updated, so none of it is true anymore. <laughs> um, I have a jobby job. I work at an agency called Latitude, where we work on retail brand experiences. So if you follow bad girl Riri on Instagram, then you know that she just did like these big pop-up stores in New York for her Puma line, and we did that stuff. Or we worked on translating their 2D ideas into 3D ideas. So that's what I do from nine to five. And then I still teach. Um, and I no longer consider myself an occasional artist. I consider myself only an artist, and I do other crap because I need to make a living. So that's good to know. I think there was one more thing in there that I'm trying to remember that was relevant. Um, but I forget. There's like at least two more people I'm expecting. Like I literally saw them in the building a minute ago, but you know what? We're gonna get into it. Oh, I know how we'll buy some time. To anyone, to the like two people here that don't work at MCAD, um, <laughs> uh, over the next three months, I'm teaching five one-night workshops um, through continuing education. There is one about branding, one about ideation and process, one about making typographic posters, a workflow one for graphic designers, and how to develop ideas for projects, like when you're at a crossroads and you're like, I need to do new work, but I don't know what to do. Um, there's one about that. And each of them is like 6.30 to 9.30, and I think they're cheap. They're like 30 bucks, and if you go here, they might be free. And if you teach here, they're definitely free. Um, you can come just be warm bodies in the room and like boost my ego some. <laughs> All right. I think I hit Command L in the wrong thing. Okay, so first off, uh, I talk about all the same stuff that I'm going to talk about today on Twitter and Instagram and Snapchat and YouTube. I do a daily video blog on YouTube, and the username across the board is MBA Joshua. Um, and, uh, and I kept trying to get it right, and I went, decided the first one was the best one. So, uh, Okay, quantity over quality and other counterintuitive creative strategies. So um, what am I trying to say here today? One, is it dark enough, or is it cool? Good. All right, sweet, especially because you're in the back in the dark, so you're fine. Um, I'm going to jump right into this. So. I do this thing where I have plastic bags. Every time there's like a plastic bag in the kitchen, it goes in the corner behind the compost. Oh, we need some sound. I actually muted this, but let's have some sound. Can we hear it? Hold on one sec, I apologize. We gotta start it again, right? Come on, you do it. 
Still nothing. All right, hold on. I should have taken care of these technical testing things earlier, but I apologize. All right, sound. I got a head. Oh, I'm on HDMI, aren't I? Whoa! Yeah. Fix that. I apologize. All right, let's try that. We're off to a super professional start. <laughs> All right, see how loud that is. We got to get it right. All right, that's reasonable. Ambience. Okay, so what I do, every time there's a plastic bag in the kitchen, it goes in the corner of the counter, and um, it goes behind the compost, and anything that doesn't go in the actual garbage can that's like gross, like say meat wrapping or something, that stuff goes in the normal trash. The compost stuff goes in the compost. And anything dry goes in this bag. The other things that go in it are any Legos, crayons, or blocks that have been left on the floor when, I, when the kids are in bed. So if I walk through the house and there's a Lego, it goes in one of these bags. Um, so I have this bag, and I fill it up. And once it's full, at some point, I will have 10 minutes of time when I get home from work and the, it's still light out and the kids are kind of occupied enough to let me do something, um, I will make photos from it. Oh, is this like, this is whack, sorry. I was experimenting with InDesign um, and making videos and apparently it's like annoying. Here we go, so here's our other one. So then I will shoot like hundreds of photos of the bag. Um, so this is like my Dropbox as everything starts sinking. So I just sit there and I play with uh, making compositions, the burst function, the panorama function, the boomerang app in Instagram, and the slow-mo function. It used to be that it took me like five minutes and now it takes a really long time because I have to run through this array of things. And if I'm lucky, I get a bunch of interesting images out of that. I at no point have ever considered myself a photographer. So then, all of that stuff gets posted to Instagram. Uh, it, it gets processed in Instagram as if Instagram is Photoshop. Uh, everything about this runs against my instincts and like what I would have thought was acceptable when I was in art school and up until maybe two years ago. Um, the fact that like my source material is kind of weird and stupid. Um, the fact that I'm like shooting it all on an iPhone. Oh, interesting. Um, the fact that it's casual. So I treat making this stuff like a smoke break. So um, I don't sit down and be like, let's work now. I'm like, okay, I've got like 20 minutes till dinner's ready. I'm gonna go sit on the front stoop. And then I'm gonna do this weird thing where I've got my phone in a bag and I'm gonna shoot the bag in panorama mode and I'm gonna walk around in my front lawn and my neighbors are gonna think I'm out of my mind. <laughs> um, and then on top of that, the entire point is to go to Instagram. I'm not interested in a portfolio. I'm not interested in having shows. I'm not interested in monetizing it. Uh, the, and my entire creative practice is based around not silliness, but kind of stupidity. Uh, and I have, it's the first time I have ever been creatively gratified. Uh, every other point in my life, I tried really hard. I took work really seriously. I thought it should take a really long time. I thought I should come up with an idea. I thought it should be conceptual, all of this stuff, which is not to dismiss people who do need to work that way, but I think it turned out that I thought I was supposed to work that way. I think that's real art. And my weird, impulsive, improvisational instincts are stupid. So this talk is basically about like the set of ideas that kind of freed me up to work the way that I work, um, yeah. and the ideas I kind of had to undo. Um, and so it's all about deprogramming reasonable beliefs, because I am a super reasonable, self-aware human being, which I think is my biggest flaw. I was telling someone last night that I wish I had like Justin Bieber five years ago levels of lack of self-awareness. <laughs> like assigning the guest book at the Anne Frank house levels of non-self-awareness. Like that's what I wish I had, Donald Trump levels. But unfortunately I have like, I don't know what I have, maybe like slightly popular rapper levels of non-self-awareness. You can sit all the way in the front and I won't be offended. 
Come on down. We've only just started. We have learned that I shoot photos of garbage on my front lawn, but you already knew that. Okay, so this is reasonable belief number one. If you do good work, people will notice. Uh, this is up there with, um, what's the other one that people always say? Let the work speak for itself. Um, the cream will rise to the top. Uh, I think those are kind of the big three. If you build it, they will come, basically. Uh, this is like the worst belief that you can possibly have. Um, because, as you know, everyone in the room has some artist that you think is amazing and they are like an unsung genius. If you do good work and people will notice, because the assumption is lots of people, right? The assumption is not, oh, 10 people will notice. You won't make a living, but at least 10 people will notice, right? The assumption is lots of people will notice. You will be able to make a living as an artist or make a living as a designer or get recognition for your work, whatever it is. But uh, I would argue, for example, that Lungfish were the greatest rock band of the last 30 years. You cannot argue that point. And yet probably at best one person in the room knows who Longfish is. If the cream rises to the top and you do good work and people will notice, then you would all know who Longfish is and you would all own Longfish records, but you don't. So therefore, that's obviously not true. And on the other hand, I will just kind of throw out the example of say Lil Yachty. I don't know if that's cream rising to the top. Uh, that's not, uh, who's awesome? I don't know who's awesome. Prodigy from Mob Deep. That one, like, probably five people know who it is at best, so. Okay, the second one, art is hard. Bullshit. I don't deny that certain types of art can be hard. I don't deny that if you grapple with certain types of subject matter, just being involved in your own work will be difficult. Um, that if you're if you do certain types of work, there's like a crazy physicality to it. Like um, there's a, I think it's a New Yorker profile of this sort of seminal 70s land artist. That dude has some condition you get from exposure to toxic construction materials and his feet are permanently bandaged up. Uh, and, uh, and he has to be basically taken care of by other people from being in the desert building this gigantic um, kind of monolithic sculpture that he's been building. That's definitely hard. That sounds awful to me, but good for him. So yes, it can be hard. There's this idea, though, that it should be hard, that you should kind of wallow in a certain amount of self-doubt, and that that's like a sign that you're on the right track. And I totally believe this. I definitely thought, oh, if I'm confused and struggling, I must be trying really hard, and I must be doing really good work. Uh, I have since switched my philosophy to one of kind of two models. The first is punk bands. Punk bands don't even care if they're good. The whole point is make work, share the work. Then make more work, then share that work. Continue to do that in an iterative state, but never ever go, well, we're not good enough to play a show. That's stupid. If you can get through the songs, you're good enough. The other model would be rappers. Every rapper comes out the gate and says, I'm the best ever. Like every mediocre mixtape rapper is the king of New York, right? Good for them. That is the level of like, lack of self-awareness that I should aspire to. So for them, art isn't hard. Make something, put it out in the world. Do it with a little bit of gusto and swagger. And then this last one. Uh, the world respects humble, conscientious, considerate, thoughtful, good listeners. Uh, people who, when they hear something, they listen to it, they take in all the facts, and they go like, you know, give me a minute to think about this and then I will come back to you with like a thoughtful answer. Um, there's a whole big trend right now of all these articles about like why you need introverts on your team and whatnot. Uh, as an introvert, being an introvert sucks. Being an introvert has been a curse. Uh, it has taken so much deprogramming to get to the point where I can like walk into a room and just sort of bullshit my way through a bunch of stuff with a certain level of confidence. Uh, I'm still got the shakes, but part of that is lack of caffeine. Um, but like, the world is not going to treat you awesome for being an introvert, but they're going to say that these are values that we care about, that you're thoughtful, that you're conscientious, that you actually listen, and that you're like, sort of reserved and measured. It's kind of like the world gives you one rule book and says, listen to the facts, be helpful, be considerate, be quiet unless you actually need to say something. 
They give that to everybody, but especially artists, because like most of us are introverts. And then they take this other rule book. That rule book also has, um, you know, let your work speak for itself. And then there's this other rule book. The other rule book is the one that pretty much the people who run the media, for example, operate by. That one says, be a raging narcissist. Be the center of attention. The quality of work doesn't matter. Uh, what's another one? Well, all the stuff we're going to talk about today. Now, that all of these are good kind of values and traits, but uh, if you don't sort of match them against the world, you are going to bang your head against this wall. Like, you probably know someone who's been trying to like make it as a painter for years, and they probably do very beautiful, maybe traditional work, whatever that means. Uh, and it's so frustrating to them when they see this sort of stuff that they think is bullshit that gets grants and shows. And they are like, they're like, that work's not good. How does everyone not know that work is not good? Well, they don't know that because it was never really about whether the work was good. It was about whether it was interesting. Does it have contrast? All of that kind of stuff. And then what's the personality of the person who's bringing that work into the world? What's that person like? This all seems very cynical, but I promise you it's not, because the main goal today is to say, only compromise your work because you're willing to make trade-offs about it. If you're not willing to make trade-offs about the core values of your work, um, understand how the world operates and kind of understand that you don't necessarily have to compromise the work if you get some of the mechanics around the work. Okay. So this is core idea number one. Everything sucks and everyone has bad taste. So I want you to think about this. Um, you have probably been dating someone at some point and you had a really great relationship and you got together, you got along really well. Maybe you were married. That's gotta be a really painful one. And, um, and you maybe, let's say you instigate the breakup. It is over, it has run its course. And like a year later, that person is living with the corniest person on the planet. And you immediately think like, whoa, does that, does that mean I was super corny? Like, was I as terrible? Because that person's horrible. Why, why would she ever be with that guy? Um, I always wonder how this feels. I've been married for like a million years, so I've sort of lucked out on this front for now. But like when I see people get divorced that I know, and then one of them is with just the corniest person, you're just like, oh man, that's got a sting worse than the actual divorce. So now, is the point that you were corny? No, you're awesome, because you're awesome. Um, the other person is corny. You thought that your former boyfriend or girlfriend had good taste because they were with you. They didn't have good taste because they were with you. What you think is awesome about you and what they thought were awesome about you are two totally different things. This applies to work, too. So I have Alien Workshop here, but let's talk about ex-employers first. Uh, so I had this client that was great. Uh, they let me do kind of whatever I wanted, and we did really nice work, and we got along super well. They almost never had changes, which was cool. Um, and uh, yeah, it was great. We'd, go, we'd have meetings, and the meetings would sprawl out for an hour and a half, even though they only needed to be 15 minutes. At one point, though, I was too busy between doing like a long-term contract job and teaching to do work effectively for them anymore. So I basically called them and said, I can't work for you anymore. I wish I could, but, but I, it doesn't, the cost doesn't justify it, basically. And I gave them the names of a couple of designers that I thought would be like a great fit based on what we'd established over the last two years. So a couple months later, I find out that the designers I recommended, they didn't use. Um, which I was sort of in shock by because one of them was a former student and she's hands down the best designer I've ever met. Like when she was a student and I had to critique her work, I just thought this sucks. It sucks that I even have to talk about your stuff as if it's not better than my stuff. Uh, but she was also hands down the biggest introvert I've ever met in my life. Not like creepy where you fear for your life in their presence, <laughs> but just super quiet, reserved, only saying what absolutely needs to be said. Um, and even like when you warm up, they're still mostly quiet and then a joke comes out and then it's like quiet again. Uh, go figure that they didn't get the job. Now, then the work started coming out and the work was lame and I was so confused and this was sort of like early on in my career, like maybe five years in and I thought, I don't understand what happened. I thought they had good taste. We 
taught, we like had great reference points. We did really good work. They let me do what I want. So obviously they have good taste if they're letting me do my work. Um, and I gave them a recommendation of an awesome designer. And then like they're doing this stuff that's kind of run of the mill and pedestrian. What has happened? Well, they didn't have good taste. The reason that we got along and worked well together is because my work was good enough for what they needed. This is very key. It was good enough for the things that they needed. The new work that I thought was bad, also good enough for what they needed, which is basically a sheet of paper with words on it that goes in the mail on time. Uh, we got along super well. That's very critical. Um, we did have some shared references, and we had some friends in common. All of that stuff added up to me thinking they had good taste and recognized good work. But good work is like the smallest part of what they needed from me. What they needed was timeliness, efficiency, um, and a certain degree of competence. And competence isn't really the same as good work, right? So uh, once I eventually started to grapple with this idea of like good work, that there is no such thing as good work, I kind of picked it up from Buddhists is sort of where I owe this. There's this great Australian nun named Rabina Corton, and she talks about the idea that fundamentally there's no difference between Miles Davis and a truck backing up. They're both just sounds going into your brain. And depending on a whole bunch of stories in your past, those sounds are processed in different ways, and you feel different things, and you think different things about them. Now, obviously, I still think Miles Davis is great, and the truck backing up is not so great. But the main point is that, yeah, everything does suck. I have good taste. I have good taste because I like the good things I like. Your taste is bad to me, but it should be awesome to you. The things that I think suck that you like are awesome. Uh, part of the helpfulness of this is realizing that there's very little correlation between the form, the content, the meaning of things, and whether they're popular. A bunch of graphic designers that I've known for years now have had crazy opportunities with pop stars. Um, I never would have seen that coming. And even now, I'm not about to think, oh, this type of graphic design is having its moment, and things are going to shift and be really awesome and thoughtful and considerate. I'm like, the pop machinations have embraced the art world, and because of that, they've embraced the art world's designers. Eventually, they will be done, and they will spit all that stuff out. The most dangerous thing would be to think, I want to work with pop stars. I should start making that kind of work. Because like, that's not how it worked out. It worked out that all these designers had a history in a certain world. That history is what brought them in the door, not what the work looks like. Like Nobody can convince me that Jay-Z saw the No Age record that Brian Rodinger designed and was like, this dude, we need this dude to do it. A bunch of people around him were like, you know, we've been working with artists. We're referencing Picasso. This dude designs art catalogs. Cool. Let's work with him. Now, it doesn't mean that it's not a good working relationship or that the work is actually good. But it does mean chasing after these things that look like a, a new horizon. Oh, this is what sculpture should be like right now. You know, remember like when everybody was doing the thing where they put a stool with a book and a ladder and a piece of canvas on the wall? Like this was all installations for two years at MCAD. Um, <laughs> and like now that's done, right? And a whole bunch of people didn't make the work they should have made, which is whatever their weird instincts were because they were busy chasing after a thing that wasn't actually a thing. It was a moment that two or three other people were doing based on their history. So that point would be liberation. Like, if you can not be concerned about, is the work I'm doing going to be good enough for this market? Uh, should I be chasing after this? Uh, that gallery is not going to like my stuff. All of those kind of stories. And instead, you're just like, OK. My job is to make my work. I can't control the sort of outcome of that. Like where it goes after I'm done is going to be sort of up to chance. But if I start to understand some of the machinations around it, maybe I have a chance to do my work and hopefully get some recognition for it. So like the first thing I tell literally all my students is like, don't ever try to do things you think that I will like. Because I almost certainly won't like them the minute you do that. I have no idea how long this is going to take, because I only rehearse things in the car. Uh, and I just go for drives. So like when it gets to 1250, just be like, shut up. OK, so strategy, quantity over quality. This is huge to me. So I think there's three reasons to pursue a quantity over quality approach. There's the development of skills, there's building momentum, and there's getting attention. 
So the skills thing is really obvious to everyone. Foundation year of art school is all about the idea of quantity over quality. You are trying as hard as you can, but no one expects what you make to be any good, frankly. I didn't expect my Foundation 2D students to impress me, right? I just expected them to work and to do the 70 versions of the three black boxes inside another box that I was asking for, and that hopefully they would make discoveries. But I didn't think they would be good by any stretch of the imagination, or even interesting. I was wrong, though. So we sort of intuitively get this. Photo one, burn through cards or film. Um, sculpture, start making lots of small things, and then you filter down and you make bigger and bigger things based off that. Um, everything has like a basically a depth to it. You make lots of gestural drawings, and then once you're warmed up and you've explored your tools, you make some longer drawings. And like if you really kind of have a stomach, you trash everything as soon as you possibly can because there's no need to be precious about it. You can always make more. But what we end up doing is we stop doing that. Um, like as teachers, we get later in the program, we don't say like, you know what? I think your most productive thing would be to make 200 posters in the next three weeks. I don't even particularly care if they're good, so long as you're engaged when you do them. So they could suck and be weird and terrible. I am fine with that. If in the moment that you made that weird and terrible thing, you were 100% in it and like committed to an outcome. I'm going to make this thing, and I'm not watching uh, 24 season 8 right now, binge watching it. Uh, I'm going to be focused on this and I'm gonna get it good enough, and then I'm gonna do the next one. I'm gonna get that good enough, and I'm gonna do the next one. And you're gonna cover all this ground. Nobody really does that as they get further along. And certainly professionals don't do that. They, like every design agency will convince you that when you walk in their office, it's covered in sketches and shit. They're full of it. They only do that stuff to try to impress the clients when they show up. Or they'll throw up a bunch of mood boards, and the mood boards are nonsense. None of it went into the actual work. It just makes it look like they're like thinking, even though they did everything the day before. So, um, but it's valuable to hit that quantity over quality. The thing I noticed with uh, photography was that in the beginning, I was fascinated with the basics of it, that I would shoot like 10, 20 images. And I might post all of them and share them. And then what started happening was that I would shoot 100 and post three. And then I would shoot 200, and I would be like, ah, oh, I'm going to have to really go through these. I'm not sure how I feel about them today. We'll see how I feel about them tomorrow. And then sometimes it's like garbage, garbage, garbage. And you're like, oh, whatever. There's nothing good. And you move on. As you build up that sort of quantity, if you have standards, you will actually instinctively maybe share less but do more. That's what I think that the habit that I've picked up. Uh, and I'm so grateful to have picked up. Because I used to be like the masterpiece designer. I would like come up with an idea. OK. It's about this. And then I would make the one thing, and the one thing would take three days. Uh, and since I've sort of stopped doing that, and instead I try to come up with like, OK, if I had to do 40 ideas today, what would they be? And then I start generating more stuff. My work has gotten exponentially better. Um, but I used to just like slave over the one thing. The other reason is momentum. So uh, you know, one of the reasons that someone like Michael Jordan was able to stay dominant in basketball for so long, uh, and a thing to keep in mind is that, um, was it the game where he had the flu? That was a comeback game, right? He was 42 or something ridiculous. Uh, his highest scoring game was, was in his comeback phase because one of the things that he never stopped doing was that quantity over quality drilling. He always assumed that somebody younger and more naturally talented was doing more than him. So he had to make sure he was doing as much as he possibly could. And it's funny, like just last night, I saw a video on uh, Instagram of the skateboarder Ronnie Krieger. He's kind of a legendary skateboarder from the 90s. He's probably like two years younger than older than, older than me. So he's either 37 or 42. Either way, he's too old to be a skateboarder. And um, part of the reason that he has momentum, because if any of you are 40, you know it sucks. Um, is that he does 100 kickflips a day. That's how he warms up. Like, boom. And he's, he's filming it. He's rolling kickflip, 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 kickflip. It's the same as a basketball player drilling free throws. It's the same as maintaining a practice of sketching and drawing or shooting, even though you don't have an idea. That you, or writing, 
even though you don't necessarily have something to say, that you just keep working because it keeps you flexible and limber. We tend to forget that because we get so goal-oriented. They're like, well, I don't really have an idea. Eh, okay, cool. I won't work on this today. It's almost like you have to work on it today just to make sure you have an idea later. The last one is attention. The world loves prolific artists. Uh, the first thing that happens if we sort of flip it and say quality over quantity is we can only name like Stanley Kubrick, J.D. Salinger, a contemporary might be Frank Ocean. Um, there are so few sort of uh, famous or successful or legendary artists that are actually hyper-psychotic perfectionists that only come out with one thing a decade that we can only come up with a handful of names. In general, when you meet the hyper-perfectionist, you meet a hater. You meet a bitter, angry person who is very upset about the entire state that things have taken, and they're like, you know, art takes time. Well, oh, I'm, it, it, no, it does. It doesn't seem to take time for you because you don't ever produce anything. None of your art makes it out in the world. It just sits there needing to be ever more perfectionist. Meanwhile, you put your stuff out in the world and you share it and people gravitate towards it. A thing that um, I'm gonna come back to in a minute. So Carrie mentioned that uh, probably two years ago to the day, I gave a talk called um, How to Paint Like Gerhard Richter. Uh, that is a lot like this. It is sloppy, it is weird. Uh, I say uh a lot. I have to look at the slides to know what I'm supposed to be talking about. Um, could be argued it's terrible. It's not, it's awesome, but it could be argued that it's terrible. And uh, I don't know how many people are in the room, more than right now, but not a lot, like maybe 20. That video of it has something like 35,000 views. If I was operating in this quality over quantity, I would say, you know what, I need to do that again. Maybe I can like schedule a kind of follow-up, I'll rehearse it more, um, I will make sure that that weird one blank slide isn't in there. I will make sure the joke about Dennis Hopper lands quickly, all of that stuff. It turns out that those things, those apparent notions of quality, nobody cares about that. There's maybe like two weirdos in the comments that say, say like again. And it's like, all right. Like, I don't know what to say. Like, this is how I talk. So you get attention that way. A uh, thing I've noticed like with my wife, so we kind of have this weird thing. We're both like love, in we like love Instagram. And, but she's still like a photographer. So she goes out and shoots and she like agonizes over the edit and she, she works on everything in Photoshop and Lightroom and all of that great stuff. And then she'll post like one photo. And what's amazing, and it makes me very jealous because I'll be sitting on the couch and she'll be like, whoa, that got 70 likes in two minutes. And you're like, what? How are you doing this? Uh, but then it's funny because she has basically no followers. It's all these people that see this thing and they're like, oh, cool. And then they move on. I post six to 12 things a day. Um, I get punished by Instagram for doing so and a lot of it disappears and you can't even see it. Uh, so and it'd be like, it'll take three days and the photo will have 25 likes. But what I notice is that my follower count is constantly moving up because I'm constantly in people's way. Uh, and I believe in my stuff. If I didn't believe in it, this would be a different story, but I think what I do is great and warrants a lot of it. So um, I get more attention just from the prolificness. Uh, it doesn't matter how good the one tweet you write is. It can be super hilarious. If no one sees it, it doesn't matter. You have to show up again and again and again, which just by virtue of that means you kind of have to once in a while not be as awesome as you could be. If you're familiar with the oeuvre of Dr. Seuss, there is a book called The Cat in the Hat Comes Back. That book is terrible, terrible garbage. It happens. Being prolific means that not everything is gonna be excellent. But um, even not being prolific, like Stanley Kubrick, requires that at one point you probably were. We forget that Stanley Kubrick used to be prolific in the 50s and right into the 60s before he went into hermit mode and showed up once a decade. Uh, this is for a quote from Ryan Holiday. We have to create situations which force us to do more and more and more to see what we're really capable of. The result is that we'll improve with each attempt and our output will begin to approach our demanding tastes over time. Uh, 
this is exactly how I see this. So nobody is really here. Cool. That's fine. Uh, I'm going to do the best job I can. I'm going to put the thing out in the world anyway. I'm also going to view it as research regardless. Every single thing I do, I just assume is research for the next thing because I know that there's no such thing as a breakthrough moment. They're incredibly rare when, you know, the Beatles, Ed Sullivan moment, which wasn't really a breakthrough because all those screaming girls already were into the Beatles. So that already goes to show you that there's no such thing. Um, so I assume that at any given moment, I'm just working on the foundation for the next thing, which makes me very happy and satisfied all the time. Um, I like this note, tagging. I was thinking about graffiti, because graffiti is all about quantity over quality. So like, if you ever knew graffiti artists growing up, you know, we all had our black books, and they're just filled with tag after tag after tag after tag. And like, if it's real garbage, you just fill it up with black, and then you get a silver paint pen, and you keep trying. In everyone's rooms, the walls are covered in terrible graffiti. And you start going out in the world and putting stuff out there, even though it's not great. But like, the only way to get great is to make the work. I think that graffiti, like punk rock, is such a perfect encapsulation of a every moment is preparing for the next moment instead of waiting around to be like, ah, I'm awesome. Now let's show the world my fantastic stuff. I kind of believe like, let's get everyone interested while I'm terrible. Like, like get the spark of something. Like that dude says like too much and he's kind of a moron. Uh, but I like that thing he said about James Franco. Oh, okay, my man Grant Cardone. This is where I, I built this philosophy. channel okay that's where you're going to get all your tv in the future so i start dumping video i create video i don't need to do quality first i need to do quantity first because quantity is going to reign the day if you want to win a war it will not be how perfect every shot is it will be can i can i basically become omnipresent and cover up the other side so we dropped, I don't know, at that time, I think I dropped 400 videos a year. Uh, within 10 months, maybe 12 months, I got a phone call from New York. Hey, we saw one of your videos on YouTube. Was it quality? No. It wasn't quality. It wasn't perfect. I, I, I have never looked at a video I dropped on YouTube. Oh, I just did. Oh, sorry. Oh, we're back. So, um, so <laughs> Grant Cardone is fantastic. Uh, I, one of my ways of figuring out who I'm going to listen to is how uncomfortable do they make me right off the bat? Like, if you kind of make my skin crawl, I'm like, hmm, you might be onto something. So I love extroverted narcissists. Uh, and he's a, he's a Scientology whale. So he's one of those people where, um, he's like an ultra rich real estate guy. He's one of those people that funds when Scientology spies on someone for 10 years, which is a terrible, awful thing. Um, uh, but I love him nonetheless. But when I heard this interview, I was like, oh my God, that's totally true. Like, this whole time, so the thing I used to do is I'd finish work and there'd be an unresolved spot and I would never show it to anyone. Like, it'd come back from the printer, it'd go to the client, it's good enough for the client, whatever. But it was like, ah, I didn't figure out that one piece. And then I realized, like, no one cares. Like, I did not throw away the most recent Aesop Rock record because I don't like the song about the cat. You know what I mean? Like, I didn't go, oh, terrible, awful garbage, right? I just was like, eh, I like everything else more than I dislike that. We will continue listening to it. You know, there are songs, uh, like, I'm a, I obsessively listen to this one Coogee rap song. The chorus sucks, but the rest of the song is great. So I ride it out. I just apply the same logic to my own stuff for better or worse. Oh, I gotta, man. Every time I like mess with the video, I get uh, beat up by the acrobat. Come on, there we go. Is there anything else? No, okay. All attention is good and or funny. This is a hard one to deal with. Uh, this is one I picked up from pickup artists. So, if you were like aware of like when pickup artists were a thing in the uh, the early thousands, like Mystery, and there were like those TV shows and the Neil Strauss book and whatnot, one of their deals was the idea of peacocking. So peacocking was like you go out to a nightclub and you wear something absurd. You wear the kind of thing that if you wore it to a construction site, you'd get beat up. So like a scarf, or crazy leather pants, or whatever. Like 
eyeliner and giant rings or like a really dumb hat. And, uh, and that as a result of doing that, you, get ne you actually get negative attention. The negative attention is better than no attention, which is like super counterintuitive, right? Like you don't wanna walk into a room and have people be like, who's this asshole, right? Um, except that you do, you totally want that. So I, I have this ridiculous hat. It's like, uh, it's from one of our clients. Sorry, Adidas, for dissing your hat. Um, and uh, I love wearing it because I like walk down the street and I, that you can't pull this hat off if you're not going to be happy and confident in the moment because you look ridiculous. Uh, and the, the looks I get from people are fantastic. Um, so like, yes, I am peacocking. Uh, now, evidence that all attention is good and or funny if you lean into it. Uh, so I mean, so Donald Trump, first and foremost, right? Um, if Hillary Clinton could get Donald Tr could get the media to hang on her every word the way they do with Donald Trump, she'd lock the election down. Unfortunately, she's not unfortunately, I don't have an opinion, but she's completely bogged down in the health rumors and the email thing, right? Um, if, she, if she could get to the point where she just says random stuff and it gets headlines, she would win. The problem is that Donald Trump says outrageous stuff all the time and then never apologizes and makes it worse. And then the media is like, oh, I can't believe he did that. And then they give him more coverage. So like his negative coverage is in large part positive, it's attention. Hillary Clinton's is not so much because we're all running around thinking she's a, thick, a sick criminal, which is not a good look. Um, but without all the hate he gets, he could not be president. And I was thinking about the Meek Mill versus Drake beef of earlier this year, late last year. So Drake dissed Meek Mill over, no, Meek Mill dissed Drake over something stupid um, that he shouldn't have even opened his mouth about. And, and Drake just came back at him again and again. He wrote two diss songs before Meek Mill responded. When Meek Mill did respond, his song was garbage. Uh, everyone declared Meek's career to be over. And then on top of that, um, he turned into a giant human meme at that point, to the, to the point where Drake is playing concerts and has giant Meek Mill Instagram memes behind him. And everyone said that he ended his career, but that's clearly not true, because last I checked, Meek Mill now has a bigger audience because a whole bunch of Drake haters like now know who Meek Mill is. He uh, still has a record deal. He still has a deal with Puma, and more people know who he was than before. Uh, the other really famous one is Jay-Z versus Nas. So it's supposed to be that, that Nas ended Jay-Z's career. How is that working out for Nas? <laughs> like, I love Nas, don't get me wrong, or I liked Nas in 1996, but he did not end Jay-Z's career in any way, shape, or form. Uh, if anything, he kind of tailgated on it a little bit. Uh, and then I think awesome things will happen for Ryan Lochte as a result of his asinineness. <laughs> or like how Hillary Clinton has introduced the world to the alt-right. Oops. So, how are we doing for time? 12.54. 12 12.54, all right. Let's, we're going to jump ahead. Because I want to talk about my last thing. Don't try, do. This sounds like a horrible thing that you would see on Instagram. Like, don't try, just go with the flow. Someday everything will make perfect sense. For now, laugh at the confusion. Basically, like, don't deal with anything, just assume it will be fine, which I, maybe is true. But when I say don't try, do, I mean that get past the idea of always needing to come up with an idea and get to a point where you're working and work comes out of the idea. So. This is the original sketch of this presentation. I designed it in InDesign. I probably would have gone with Hobo, but it was color-coded, basically. Um, but the problem is that I got completely bogged down in picking typefaces, um, and I couldn't see the end result at all. So I switched over to index cards. The index cards, like I do five of them, and like the yellow ones, and I was like, oh, that actually looks good. Maybe, should I just do handwriting? Should I just do index cards? Then. My two-year-old sees the index cards and gets jealous, and she's like, give me a purple one. And she makes a drawing. Oh. And I was like, oh, that's kind of cool. Then she makes more drawings, and then she's wasting all my index cards. And I was like, oh, she just designed the presentation. Like, it's color-coded. We're going to make it all index cards. Awesome. Um, I never had the idea of, oh, wouldn't it be super cool and clever and process-oriented? I just like, followed the work where it went. It wasn't working. It was uncomfortable. To me, pain is a warning I'm on the wrong track. Okay. 
do something different. Index cards. This is like a plan for something. Uh, so it's an idea for a design history podcast. I thought the whole thing through. I figured out sponsorship, scheduling, how I would test the idea, how much money I needed to like give us a stipend. It's an awesome idea. I have realized I am never gonna do this. This is a fantasy and a daydream. It is no different than when someone is on a dating profile and puts up the things that they want in their partner and they're not getting any of that. Uh, what I need to do, I've determined, Man, alive. The, um, the moving through these pages sucks, huh? All right, what I've realized I need to do is make everything into an addiction and make it impulsive. So I go for a walk. I take pictures of trees. Hundreds of pictures of trees over my lunch break. I don't eat lunch with people anymore. Um, I go and obsessively take all the pictures of trees, which is great and fun. Um, or whatever it is. I don't even know what it is. Apparently, I'm a landscape photographer. But this is like what I do over my lunch break. Same methodology as the garbage sculpture. Uh, if it turns out, it's awesome. If it doesn't turn out, who cares? Let's jump ahead. Can we jump ahead? God, this thing sucks. All right. Don't use the, this thing. That's all I can say. Then that stuff becomes, we'll wrap this up quickly, my friends. These photographs, same deal. All of a sudden, there is a body of work based off my lunch break. Oh, <laughs> and then there's the Instagram thing. I don't know what that's about. It doesn't matter. So there's um, a body of work that emerges from just going on walks and being like, ah, oh, I should take pictures. Everything I've figured out about my own process is based on laziness and ease, impulsiveness and improvisation. The facts are I'm way more productive than when I used to be serious. Now, I'm not saying everybody should do this, but I do say if you feel like you're not getting anything done, that you're not finishing work, that you're not shipping work, that maybe it's time to let go of all of that kind of nonsense and those initial beliefs and embrace like what's the easiest way for me to work, what's the most joyful way, and how can I put that work out in the world? All right, thank you. <laughs>